fighting your after service, fighting yourself after service and avoiding the good jobs too. That's what we're going to be covering today, guys. Uh, there is, as many of you know, a covert job problem uh, for military veterans. And I think many of you have probably seen that study. Uh, there was a recent study put out by ZipRecruiter and Code that found that more than 50% of veterans who get hired are already looking for their next job within six months. And then the research followed uh, that by Corn uh, Ferry Institute found that 43% of veterans leave their first job within a year. By year two, 80% of us have already cycled out. I totally get it. I was there when I was getting uh, when I was getting out. So the key today, guys, is we're really going to unpack how you find yourself after service and how you avoid this good job stew bouncing around, etc. So welcome to the Military Wire with Mike Schindler. This is the podcast where we interview America's most elite men and women who have served this country. We share their stories of overcoming, their proven lessons in leadership, and their journey to finding mission and purpose. And I'm going to tell you, I'm pretty excited about today's guest. I've got a special guest on this show, John St. John. He's a senior human uh, resources business partner. Uh, but beyond that, so he's got ample experience in the HR world, which is why we've got him on the show. But beyond that, he's a professional coach. He owns a company called Changing Paths that is just crushing it in the marketplace. So, John, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me, Mike. Yeah, excited to have you here. So I, I want to start with your story because you've got an interesting background. You're in the HR world now. Mm -hmm. I want to learn from you and, you know, kind of how, you know, how, how do they avoid that good job, Stu, as you put it? Those are your words. I love those words. <laughs> Thank uh, you. Yeah, those are such great words. So we're going we're gonna to talk about the stew today, but from your perspective as an HR person, but also from your perspective as somebody who served in the military. So let's start with your story. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, wow. So when I think about my story, uh, just a cliff note, I grew up in a place called uh, Marin City, and it, back in the 70s, wasn't a garden spot of the world. As, as a matter of fact, uh, it was the home to a lot of crime, a lot of fear, a lot of death. I mean, it was a bad deal, but all around me was affluence in Marin County. And seeing all that affluence and looking at the difference between where I was in life at age 10 and looking at the world around me, I started to do the math pretty quickly. And luckily, my dad did the math, too. And he said, we got to get out of here. And that started me on the road to discovering that there was more to life than the pain that I saw every day, that the, there was more to existing than just existing. So we moved out of that neighborhood and over the course of several years, a couple of decades, um, I was able to move into other neighborhoods and see how other people lived and began to understand that there were other opportunities for me to grow and to learn and become all that I could be. Even at age you know, 15 and 16, when I started to get my first job, I saw that if I applied myself, I could do just about anything. <laughs> so what, go ahead. Well, John, so how, how, so this is interesting because some, some kids like teens, right? We've, we've all been there at, mm -hmm. at 15 pick, pick, you know, they pick different paths and you mm -hmm. saw affluence and said, boy, that's the direction I want to go. And others, and I'm sure you and I both know people that have chosen other paths. So it's like, this is my lot in life. Was mm -hmm. there was there any trigger that uh, that your that you had as a family that just kind of prompted you to say, no, you know what? I'm not going down that path. I'm going down this path. Because I'm asking that question because as adults, we still have those type of decisions to make, right? Absolutely. Yeah. So, so what was it? So how did you? What was the trigger for you? I can remember it like it was yesterday. Uh, I was 10 years old. I went to my dad, maybe even nine, went to my dad. I said, hey, dad, um, can I have a quarter to go to the local store and get you know some penny candies? His response just, just never left my mind. He said, I don't have it. And I'm thinking, it's a quarter. You're a grown man, not to slam dad, but you don't have a quarter? And they dawned on me that if I wanted something, I would have to play an active role in it. So that was the turning point for me in my life where, you know, I went on a hunt to find 
it started out as 25 cents, but ended up being several dollars uh, going from everything from, I don't know if you remember the RC Cola program where they had the <laughs> bottle caps and on the backside they had like, or on the inside, they had like 10 cents, 25 cents. I got together with my friend Curtis and we went in search of these things. Then we got turned on to redeeming bottles and the rest is just history. The realization that if I wanted money to flow into my life, I needed to do something about it, not just ask someone for it. Uh, so good. Gosh, it's so good. That's so good. Okay, so so let's fast track. You 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 determine. Okay, I got to do something with my life. You join the mm -hmm. military, correct? Yes. Yeah. So mm -hmm. talk talk to us about that because many of our listeners, the majority of our listeners, are serving, have served. Uh, what prompted you to join the military? Well, initially, it was for uh, I wanted to go into the Army Reserve. And what prompted me to go was I knew I had to get to school. I watched my older brother go to school and he talked about this thing called student loans and, and it just didn't sound like a really favorable path. Yeah, no kidding. Yeah. I also had this early in life, this wanderlust. And of course, when you go down to the recruiter's office, they begin to tell you, hey, there's a whole world of places you can go, earn money, you know, <laughs> by way of income, and you can travel. And you don't have to pay. I said, what? <laughs> and they said, yeah, you know, you can take hops. What's a hop? You can get on the military plane and go point to point. Of course, we learned later that there's some rules around it. It's not as <laughs> loose as, as it was made out to be. But ultimately, the recruiter was spot on. She saw me coming a mile off. She said, you know, I'm not going to point you in the direction of active duty. I'm going to send you to the reserves. I later went on active duty. But I joined the reserves for the academic component. And when I finished uh, my first four years of, of college, and I realized that, you know what, I still want to serve. I had considered going into the officer corps, but that just wasn't a fit for me. And I said, you know what, the economy's down. This is my time. I'm going to go on active. So I went to Germany, spent three years there. It was fabulous. Mm, nice. nice. I, I just don't, yep. I, you know what, Mike, I just don't understand why some guys didn't want to leave the base. Right. <laughs> but every weekend <laughs> I was gone every weekend. Yeah. I'd come back and he said, where'd you go? You know, it was like, a, you know, every time I come back on base, you know, around like, you know, 4.30, 5 o'clock, they said, where'd you go? And we'd have a sit down. I said, hey, I went up to Trier. Oh, oh I went to Sopelheim. Oh, I went to, you know, Berlin. Or I went, you know, and these guys were just amazed. I said, well, why don't you come with me next weekend? They're like, nah, nah. <laughs> is that right? See, that is yeah. so amazing. But see, that, that speaks to your spirit. This is what I'm loving about this conversation, because here you had the epiphany of just a quarter, right? You pursue, mm -hmm. right? You get on that path. And then you you have this opportunity to be in Germany and you're like, oh, why would I stay here? I'm going to seek and discover. Exactly. Uh, ah, so good. John, so, okay. So you, you have this military experience, which is mm -hmm. great. And then like everybody else, you got to transition, right? It's time to leave. Right. You got to go. You're getting into the civilian sector. What, what was one of the biggest challenges you faced in that transition? Oh, wow. Um, I think we've all have or will have this this experience where they, they give you your papers, you, you you go through the high of getting on the plane, you land at your out processing location, and then you, you, you finish, you're still in the military at that point, you fill out your paperwork, and then you leave the gate and it dawns on you. It's just like, I don't have anywhere to be tomorrow morning. Right. <laughs> Oh my God, I got this reality. And no how no matter how much you plan, that that shock kind of hits you. So um as far as uh, the, the transitioning component, when I got out, I, I had come out of like a military personnel. So I was like a 71 Lima. I was an admin specialist. I had an opportunity to be a training NCO, mailroom supervisor. So a lot of military admin stuff. But the, un the difficulty was it was like going from the military to the job market was like going from one country to another. It's like when it came to like your occupation, it was like a different language I had to learn. Mm. I mean, I've heard terms like you have to take the boots off your resume. And there's some truth in that, that you have to translate uh, your old world to the new world so that the people who are hiring you that have no idea about what the military is like beyond I got a friend in or my dad served, uh, what it is you actually did. And, you know, when I was at Fort Dix, Dix coming out, 
I was talking to a, a guy in the room who was telling us, you know, you, these are things, you know, transition guy felt, helps you with your paperwork. Says if you've got a VA claim, this is your last opportunity. Remember that oh, guy? Yeah. All right. Oh, so yeah. he's he's telling you all this stuff and trying to give you a leg up and say, you know what? Uh, there are lots of opportunities. And one guy says, uh, I don't know for me. He says, well, what was your your MOS? He says, I was a sniper. <laughs> so we all kind of stopped and we're like, oh, wow, he's got a point. What is he going to do? especially if he doesn't want to go into like law enforcement yeah. or go work for the government again. That And the look on his face was, I'm done carrying around this weapon and being an instrument of destruction, even though, you know, I'm a patriot and all that stuff. This point, this skill, I don't want to use this anymore. And I was kind of at that place where some of what I learned was not going to be useful in the civilian world. So I began to examine how do I translate what I have into what the market needs. And for me, it was it was pretty clear that, you know what, I'm going to go in the direction of the most similar thing that I want to do, not focusing on um, trying to do an apples to apples comparison. I was looking for the closest thing to what I did in the military that I still enjoyed and tracked for that, which was HR. Mm. So yeah, I, on the outside, human resources. Yeah, so I want to unpack that a little bit because there's a couple of things you said here that I think are key is in the military, mm -hmm. I, I think what you were alluding to, and correct me if I'm wrong, but we have the skills and ability to do anything, almost mm -hmm. anything with a little bit of training, right? So we can gravitate toward that. Yeah. But I think what you said that was key as I was listening to you is the the closest thing that I was doing that I wanted to do, which I think is yes. so key because in your... You know, in this topic, when we're talking about finding you after service, mm -hmm. that's the piece that you're triggering is, no, what I wanted to do. So unpack this. How did you really discover what you wanted to do, John? Because it, we see the studies, right? These guys can get the jobs. Mm -hmm. There's low unemployment. It's There's no question we can right. get hired. But the, but the, the big elephant in the room is the fact that 80% of them are gone within two years. So- they're missing yeah. that want to do piece. So how did you do, how did you find you after this process? How well, for me, uh, the, the easiest way that I could explain it is this, that when I when I got out and I, I started to look for opportunities for some reason, and I think that it was just divine intervention that I really tracked toward what did I enjoy most? What was I looking for? When I was on active duty, what was the one thing that I looked forward to? Well, it was helping people to transition out of the military. It was helping people um, solve their pay issues. It was helping people get trained up. And when I thought about how I felt doing those things, I looked at the civilian world and said, you know what? This job called human resources contains all those things that I'm not only good at, but I enjoy. Yeah. So that's what I focused on, not not what was available, not what I was trained to do, because that's that's the blessing and curse of being in the military. The military teaches you you can do anything, but we're going to adapt you for a specific purpose. And when we leave, we forget that we can do anything and we start to look for being adapted to a specific purpose that has nothing to do with whether you like it or not. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah, and that's so true. And half the time these guys say, hey, listen, I don't even know the purpose behind what I'm doing when we get into the civilian sector. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was I was that guy. I was that 14 jobs. And I think, John, when you and I were originally talking, I share with you how I bounced from 14 jobs trying to find that purpose and quickly understood that, wow, there wasn't really anything I couldn't do. It's just, I, I did mm -hmm. not take the time when I got out like you did to say, what is it I want to mm -hmm. do? And, and you're keying in on yeah. what makes you the happiest. Like when you get up and you're like, man, I love this piece of my job. How do I do more of that? Mm -hmm. I, I, man, that is so exactly. important. So you're on the HR side now and you're talking about mm -hmm. avoiding that good job stew. Gosh, I just love that. I, I almost feel like I need to steal <laughs> that, John. Like that's such a good... <laughs> such a good show. So yeah, you share, share it with me. You. Thank you. I'll give you credit. I'll give you credit. Oh so, yeah. Okay. Thanks. But, so you said, what do you see some of the mistakes being made when those who have served 
if you've got the opportunity to interview him, what are some of the mistakes you're seeing these guys make? Oh, wow. Um, I think the, the, some of the biggest mistakes that I see made is um, in, in the, on the civilian side, we're quick to put you into a box. Mm. Okay. So if, if you look at companies of size, when they go after military members, they're looking first at, were you a leader? Then they look at your critical skills, critical skills that the organization lacks and that they don't want to hire a leader that just kind of has a book knowledge. They want someone and when they pull someone from the military. Their expectation is you'll hit the ground running. You'll, you'll figure out what's in the environment and you'll uh, develop a strategy and you'll execute and you will manage your people well, because in the military you had to, or yep. you die. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> okay. The flip side is if you're a critical skill, like you're a registered nurse or uh, you happen to be uh, an expert in IT, uh, in communication security, when they pull you across, the expectation is your ramp's going to be very short and that's what we're hiring you to do. The mistake that I think happens is that most people get out, they're not really, they don't really want to use that skill, but they're so focused on, if I don't, I won't get a job. Mm. And that's yeah. the problem. People get out, they offer this skill that's in demand, but it's not really who they are or what they want to do. You come in and it's difficult to retain you as a talent because you realize through the work that, man, I was tired of this on active duty and I'm tired of it now. And so you kind of just half show up and now you're conflicted. It's like, oh my God, I was trained to deliver my best every day because lives are on the line, but I'm not compelled to do it. What's going on? So what you end up doing is bouncing. You end up saying, you know what? I'm conflicted. I can't give my best every day. I, I'm not plugged into the work of the people. There must be something wrong with the environment or there must be something wrong with me. And both are only half true. So That's what I see ha so how happening. So do, how does somebody avoid that? What's the one thing they can do, John, that can, that can slow that roll, that can you know, give them pause to do what you're talking about doing, which mm -hmm. is identifying the want in their life. So what's that one thing? Is there one thing? Hmm. Repeat that yeah, question, so Mike. You're talking about, right? I, I mean, there's that disconnect because we've been trained to do our best mm -hmm. every day, but there's that disconnect like, man, I am not, I am not engaged in this mission whatsoever. So we're right. talking about finding you. You're talking about really avoiding that good job stew piece, which is avoiding the bounce. Uh -huh. So what is the one thing you would right. recommend to somebody to say, listen, I'm going to help you avoid bouncing. Here's the first step you need to take in order to get on that pathway. The absolute first step is what engages you. Is, be, is knowing that how is to the answer the very that first question. thing. Is that right? Uh, yeah. Absolutely. And it's, I, th I think it's twofold. So the, the first step is you need to realize that you need to track toward what engages you as a, as a, as a person at your core that really drives you. You feel when you it's give you an example in, in a guy's frame, you're driving down the road and you look out the window and you see the mother of all cars, you slow your car down. You almost forget your look to look on the road because you're still driving, but you are so locked into this vehicle and in your mind, you are mapping every single detail <laughs> from the front bumper to the back fender. You see it all. You see the vents, you see the piping, you see the blower on the hood. You even see the types of mirrors to the point where you have to snap back and put your eyes back on the road. When you exit the military, if you don't see that vehicle of opportunity for you that you're going to be driving forward, keep driving forward. Don't stop and take a, jump in a car that you just, eh, you're sort of satisfied with, or you see something that's bright and shiny, but it doesn't have what you want. It doesn't compel you to show up for it, to tend to it, to build on it. If it doesn't do that for you, then that's not your direction of travel. Here's the other piece of it. Generally, when you get out of the military, you're in your mind, you're on this clock. It's like, I, I have these income requirements that I have to meet. Um, I don't want to have a resume that's riddled with all these stops and starts. 
all that stuff really is just fear. So it's finding out what engages you and dealing with your fear so you can manage yourself and make the best decision. So I think it's twofold. So John, you are absolutely crushing it today. I, I, I know you're at LifeBridge, you're doing, uh, you're, you're the senior human resources business partner there at LifeBridge Health, and you've got your own company that's just doing quite well called Changing Paths. Talk to us about this. What are you doing at Changing Paths? Well, at Changing Paths, my goal is to help people to go from broken to brilliance. And as the name implies, changing paths is helping people to really find their path, their passion, their purpose, their mission, and to live their best life. That's my goal. And there are five, oh. there are five ways that I do that, Mike. Uh, one, it's helping people raise their standards because oftentimes we just tolerate our conditions. Number two, I help people become like eagles to fly, to really fly in this life because there's something you were put on this planet to do and do well. Third, how to tap into how life really favors the prepared. And that's taking what you're really gifted at and honing it to the razor's edge so you can live your destiny and live beyond the need for money and operate in abundance by sharing your gift widely. And when you share your gift, your gift will take care of you and make room for you in this life. Mm. I love that. I love that. That is so good. So, I, and I got to believe that you probably use some of those same principles uh, when you're doing HR work. Is that right? Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, definitely. I have, I have constant conversations with employees who come in and sit down and say, I've hit a dead end with this career or I've hit a dead end in life. And, and I don't know, there's like this hole that I, I'm trying to fill and I can't, I, I get stressed out doing a job I hate. I'm uh, living in some circumstances that just I just don't agree with, but I don't know how to pivot. And we have these deeper conversations and people take it and run with it. Uh, I love this. So, John, I think I mean, what you're doing is so good. And, and, and we 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 talked about avoiding that good job, you know, that good job, Stu, you know, really finding that core. I love what you're doing for folks, uh, just, you know, raising their standard, you know, really mm -hmm. setting the setting themselves apart, identifying how they can fly. Uh, yeah, this is good. So how do people find you? How, how do they get in touch with you? I mean, is there something that might the audience that they can say, you know what, John, if I could just get a moment of your time, um, how do they get in touch? with you? The easiest thing to do is to visit my website, uh, C-H-G-P-A-T-H-S. So changepaths.com. And I have a contact tab. Just put in there. Hey, John, can we put 30 minutes on the calendar? It's free of charge. And we talk about you and where you need to go in this life. Mm, I love this. So guys, to our audience that's listening, this is so critical. I, I think you guys heard the stats, you know, people jumping from job to job because they haven't discovered who they are. And I, and what I love about John and John, I, I'm saying this to you is, is that you have a passion to help people find who they are after service and avoid that job mm -hmm. bouncing I love that. Yeah. So uh, guys, take advantage of John's offer. Be sure you track him down, visit his website, find him on LinkedIn. Um, I, I think it's just amazing. So for those who are interested in discovering your post-service identity, prepare, plan, and execute, I think many of you know that we have a program here as well. If that interests you, reach out to us. But I really want you guys to check out what John's got going on. Uh, you know, instant message him. Get a hold of him on LinkedIn. But John, thank you for being on the show. My absolute pleasure, Mike. Thank you.